It might have been a national holiday in the US this week, but Starbase has still been action-packed. We've seen preparations for the next flight of Starship, mysterious potential V2 booster parts, and the next exciting chapter in Boca Chica's manufacturing infrastructure, the Giga Bay. Let's kick off the week with some transport updates. As usual, there's plenty of movement into Mega Bay 1. First up, we have a ring stand, which you can see here. These stands are used to stack different rocket sections inside the bay, and we spotted one being moved into the facility. This particular stand was brought into Mega Bay 1 to support Booster 16's liquid oxygen tank, which was stacked onto its aft section inside the bay. Interestingly, that ring stand was later removed from Mega Bay 1, suggesting that the stacking process for Booster 16's LOX tank is now complete. This is yet another step forward towards a future flight, potentially Flight 9, if Booster 14 and or 15 are not reused before 16 gets to fly. Another intriguing sight was the four-point lifter, a piece of equipment specifically used to lift Starship sections. It was seen being moved around the ring yard, parked in front of Mega Bay 2, and then eventually brought inside. This lifter's movement hints at preparations for lifting or assembly work inside the bay. The lifter was later moved to the left side of Mega Bay 2, where it appeared to be parked. Using the bridge crane at the top of the bay, it was removed from its stand. These lifters play a crucial role now, because Starships no longer include the hooks traditionally used for lifting, a process that SpaceX phased out some time ago. Instead, the same lifting points used for the chopsticks on the launch tower are now repurposed for production lifts, showcasing SpaceX's focus on streamlining and this multifunctional design. This mechanism is potentially being prepared for the lift of Ship 33, which is notable as the first V2, Block 2, whatever you want to call it, next generation Starship, and the vehicle designated for the next Starship flight. The activity around the lifter suggests that Ship 33 might soon be moved to the massive test site for static fire testing and final preparations. Over at the Star Factory, the connection between the office building and the Star Factory itself appears to nearly be complete. This development could be quite significant, as with some upcoming plans we'll discuss later, having this office space fully operational could play a key role as SpaceX continues to reshape the landscape at Boca Chica. The immense scale of the Star Factory often goes underappreciated. The sheer volume of components housed within, many of which remain a mystery to us, is truly staggering. Also, they've built this thing incredibly quickly. I was fortunate enough to visit Starbase just over a year ago, and they just started putting up the beams for the new extension out towards Highway 4. Peeking inside the Star Factory, we can spot a barrel section under construction, with a significant amount of additional hardware visible in the background. We've spotted some familiar nose cones, which appear to have been repositioned since our last look. One of these stands out, now sporting more thermal protection tiles, but still awaiting its flaps. Progress around the flap areas is noticeable, with the gaps steadily closing. It seems that the thermal protection system on the nose cone is nearing completion. The more bare nose cone, which lacks the thermal protection tiles, has two worker platforms next to it. However, there haven't been any noticeable changes since Mary or Jack last took a peek. It seems like progress is still in the early stages for this particular nose cone. If you saw last week's episode, and if you haven't, then make sure you hit all the YouTube subscribe and notification buttons down there so you don't miss any in the future, it's free, you'd know that the worst Starship, Ship 26, is finally being scrapped. I mean, let's be honest, it's long overdue. And this week, the farewell of Ship 26 continues. This flapless, tireless, and now futureless ship has already been broken down into many pieces, and here we can see the nose cone of Ship 26, which has been separated from the main body. The nose cone of Ship 26 was then moved to the side of the bays and transported to the Sanchez area, where a lot of the scrapping and final disassembly takes place. This is where the nose cone and all the other parts of Ship 26 will meet its end. The Sanchez area has become the site for dismantling older or outdated hardware, marking the end of its journey in the production cycle. However, not all parts of Ship 26 ended up across the road. Here we can see more parts being transported away from the production site on the back of a truck. This particular piece is the outer reinforced frame of the ship. Nearby to the scrapping activity, SpaceX was working on the top of Booster 12 this week. This is, of course, the first and so far only booster that has successfully returned from the edge of space and was caught by the chopsticks. Typically, one might expect the company to preserve such historic hardware given its significance. However, SpaceX has shown in the past that they don't hesitate to repurpose or scrap even their most notable vehicles once they've served their purpose. Rest in peace, SN15. 
It's possible that the work on Booster 12 is just part of routine checkouts or maintenance rather than a sign of it being retired, but right now, that's just a guess. It seems the hardware on top of Booster 12 was inspected, likely to assess any damage or to check the status of the components after the structural stress of the catch. It's certainly interesting to see workers spending more time on the booster during this inspection, indicating that SpaceX is carefully evaluating its condition. However, no hardware was removed during the inspection, suggesting that it was more of a detailed examination rather than a major repair or modification. This kind of assessment is important to understand how the booster performed under the stresses of re-entry and the catch, potentially influencing future designs or procedures. They unfortunately were unable to collect any data with Booster 13's catch because, well, we've all seen the water landing in the Gulf. At Starbase, there's always some weird and unusual hardware popping up, and this particular piece is no exception. While it might look like the frame for a solid rocket booster for a Starship, it's something else entirely. This hardware was recently moved from the Star Factory to the Sanchez area, and it has sparked a lot of speculation. One popular theory is that it could be part of the frame for the V2 booster landing tank, which would be assembled around the main downcomer. This would make it a prototype part for the V2 booster, but it's not entirely clear yet. Remember, even though Flight 7 will feature a next-gen ship, the booster will still be of the current generation for the next few flights. Given how SpaceX tends to keep some of their projects under wraps or in a state of constant iteration, this part might just be a prototype or a test piece for future booster designs. If this part moves again or shows up in a different context, we'll be sure to keep an eye on it for any new future developments. Alright, shifting focus from the Star Factory and bays, let's turn our attention to Pad B. There's always something interesting happening around the launch pads and Pad B is no exception. The infrastructure work at Orbital Pad B is in full swing, with a lot of activity happening around the site. Vehicles are moving throughout the area, preparing the ground and laying the foundations for the next phase of construction. A big focus right now is the assembly of the new LR11000 crane, which will be essential for the construction of the orbital launch mount and other heavy components. Most of the arm of the LR11000 had already been assembled and the counterweights were being placed into position. The giant crane hook was then assembled right next to the crane itself and it's clear that multiple components are required to get this massive piece of equipment together. And shortly after, it was raised for the first time. Even though it's a bit smaller than the giant CC8800-1 crane that was used to build Pad B's tower, at least SpaceX's own LR11000 now has a sibling. And a big pad doesn't only need a big crane, it will also need big plumbing in the future. While this delivery was not confirmed to be for the upcoming pad, it is more than likely that this might be piping that will connect some of the tank farm and the future pad in some shape or form. It is of course impossible to predict exactly what this kind of pipe will be used for, but it is lacking any kind of heavy insulation, which usually indicates it won't be used for the extra cold fluids at Starbase. Perhaps water will be the intended purpose, or maybe these pipes will be placed underground, which could explain the lack of insulation typically seen with with other pipelines. It appears as if the pipes are being laid down in some sort of trench or dugout tunnel, which would make sense for underground insulation. This further suggests that these pipes could indeed be part of a larger infrastructure project, possibly for water or other utilities that will support the pad's operations. Inspected by Starhopper, the work to connect the necessary parts of the pad continues. The expectation is that this pad is key for launching the version 2 booster, which we're hoping will fly next year. We're pretty sure that the bottom end of the new booster design will be completely incompatible with the first, hence the new mount for Pad B looking nothing like we've seen before. Given this timeline, there is a sense of urgency as SpaceX must complete the work on schedule to avoid major downtime in Starship activity with the transition between the current generation booster and the next. Over at the original launch pad, Pad A, there was some work conducted on one of the stabilizer arms of the right chopstick. We can see workers inspecting what appears to be the connection between the main arm and the stabilizer. This suggests some fine tuning or adjustments are being made to ensure everything is properly aligned and functioning for future operations. And then we have this. Yes, these appear to be antennas mounted on the side of the chopstick. While it's known that the last catch was aborted due to the tower losing connection, this seems like an unusual and odd position to test alternative communications. It raises questions about whether SpaceX is experimenting with new methods or systems to maintain communication, possibly in preparation for future catches or tower operations. On a serious note, SpaceX likely has a very good reason to be testing antennas at this specific spot. 
However, these antennas definitely won't stay there for long as the bumper or grilled section of the sticks is directly in the path of intense heat during launch. It's likely that SpaceX is testing a particular connection angle or evaluating a temporary setup for communication purposes. The antennas are placed neatly on the inner part of the right chopstick, which could suggest they are being used for data collection. One possibility is that they're measuring the gap and potential movements of the individual chopsticks, potentially to ensure better alignment and accuracy during future booster catches. SpaceX later moved the chopsticks off their bumpers during the night. After a slow initial departure, the sticks were raised all the way to the top of their tracks. Once at the top, they performed an opening maneuver and then translated to the other side of the pad. Given that the tower is a key component for future catch attempts and the reason the previous attempt could not go ahead, it makes total sense why SpaceX would be testing its components. This move could also be verification of some minor work that was recently done, with SpaceX ensuring everything is functioning correctly before proceeding further. The chopsticks stayed at that lifted position for quite some time, which is very similar to the final catch position after a booster or ship landed between them. In fact, they stayed up there for so long that they were still there by the time that Mary had gone out the next day to start shooting photos and videos. And yes, the antennas were still in place during the long duration chopstick lift, as you can see here. Moving down from the chopsticks to the orbital launch mount, a worker was spotted inspecting the piping beneath the main ring. The piping the worker is inspecting is part of the system where the pipe rises from the ground to the OLM ring. This is a crucial connection point between the tank farm and the pad, responsible for supplying the necessary commodities for booster tanking. This area ensures the booster can be properly loaded with propellant before launch. There are also several vehicles parked around the OLM, indicating that SpaceX is performing essential refurbishment and inspections like we've seen multiple times before. With the January 11th target launch date for Flight 7, it's likely that SpaceX aims to have the booster tested and fired on this mount before the end of the year. And if you're wondering why we're so certain on the 11th, go and watch last week's episode. It'll answer all of your questions. The booster quick disconnect was also open during the week, with workers seen working on the side shielding. This could indicate that a weakness was identified that requires patching, or it could simply be part of routine maintenance and inspection. The QD is an essential part of the fueling and launching infrastructure, so it's crucial that it remains in optimal condition, ensuring smooth operations. It needs to be able to disconnect and disconnect quickly. If it fails at either of those things, then we've got a big problem. It does appear, however, that some modifications might have been needed as sparks from welding was visible late at night while workers performed work on that booster QD. Closer to the end of the week, the work was verified when the booster closing mechanism was closed again and the hood seemed to function as expected. It closed without issues, suggesting the modification was successful. Okay, this next thing, I just, I don't have a clue. Sometimes SpaceX enjoys adding a bit of confusion to the week. Below the OLM, a pinata resembling Woody from Toy Story was spotted hanging. It's unclear if there were any sweet treats inside, but hitting it might have been tricky considering it's positioned over 10 meters in the air. Again, I have no idea. Far above Woody, at the very top of the ship quick disconnect arm, workers were seen doing what they usually do, working. This potentially indicates modifications in preparation for the upcoming V2 ship, Ship 33. With SpaceX making significant updates to the upper stage, it will be interesting to track changes to this component in the coming weeks. The work then moved further towards the ship QD, which was opened as SpaceX works on the connection for the next gen ship. The ship QD is positioned quite high following the initial extension due to the hot staging ring which was bodged on top of the V1 boosters. As a result, we can expect this hardware to be in a modified position on Tower 2 moving forwards as that pad is being built with all of these changes in mind. In addition to the main connector, SpaceX was also working on the pipes that feed into it. These pipes are responsible for carrying liquid oxygen, liquid methane, carbon dioxide, helium as well as power and data connections. These connections are essential for linking the stack to the infrastructure while it's on the pad. The cover of the ship QD was seen in motion as workers attempted to reposition it, likely after completing work on the connection plate. This suggests that the necessary adjustments or modifications were made and the cover was being reattached as part of the process. Earlier, we mentioned that the office building might become crucial for SpaceX's plans and the urgency surrounding its completion could be tied to upcoming projects potentially related to the acceleration of Starship development and infrastructure work at the Boca Chica site. We've left you waiting long enough, so what developments have surfaced regarding that? Well, it sounds like a Giga Bay is going to be the next major addition to SpaceX's Starbase manufacturing facility. From a recent job posting, it seems like the company is gearing up to expand its facilities for Starship production. 
The term gigabay suggests a massive, high-capacity building, likely designed to handle large-scale assembly of Starship components. Given SpaceX's ambitions and the size of Starship hardware, this could be a facility on par with some of the world's largest manufacturing plants designed to support rapid production and testing. It'll be interesting to see how large this space actually turns out to be and what kind of advanced technology and processes will be employed inside to meet SpaceX's increasingly aggressive timelines. It's also a natural evolution in the way that SpaceX names their buildings. They took the industry standard high bay for the high bay and then they went a step bigger, they called it the mega bay and then giga is just the next order of magnitude from mega. I wonder if we'll ever get a Terra Bay. The most probable scenario is that the current Stargate building will be phased out, with most of the operations there being shifted over to the new office building. The entire area behind the multi-story car park, including the existing high bay, would then be repurposed for the construction of the Giga Bay. Repurposed is a nice way to put it. Uh, a better word would be scrapped. As the ship predominantly uses the high bay, Starship will soon, with further upgrades, surpass the high bay's capacity, quite literally, considering how tall V3 is supposed to be. So the most likely scenario is that a bigger bay will be required for Starship in the near future, especially as boosters continue to grow taller. This, in turn, will necessitate an even taller structure. According to the Starship 3 figures released by SpaceX, the ship will reach a height of 69.8 meters, while the booster will stand at 80.2 meters. The current booster stands at just 71 meters and just about fits in the existing Mega Bay 1. To accommodate the new version with a height of 80.2 meters, SpaceX would definitely need a door that is over 80.2 meters, probably closer to 85 meters maybe. Meanwhile, the ship at 69.8 meters would also be pushing the limits of the high bay, which is around 70 meters. Simply put, SpaceX requires more vertical space, which is where the Gigabay comes in. Of course, the Gigabay could end up being even larger if SpaceX chooses to dismantle Megabay 1. This would free up the space above it as well, allowing for a more expansive structure. However, this would likely mean a bit of a bottleneck in operations as they'd be limited in stacking for a year or so. Building something of that magnitude, like a Gigabay, would probably take at least a year to complete. So what do you think? Will this Gigabay just end up replacing the High Bay? Will it absorb Mega Bay 1? Will it potentially even absorb Mega Bay 2 in the future? Will SpaceX just end up building their own VAB? Let us know what you think in the comments. I will also just note though that after the job posting went live, the titles mentioning Gigabay were quietly changed to not mention that name anymore. The direct listing on X just mentions Starship Production. Very generic. Whatever it ends up being called and being shaped, we're likely in for another major shift in the Starbase skyline. It's certainly never going to get boring around here. I've been Ryan Cater for NSF, thanks for watching, and goodbye.